Creating the DESA. I'm your host, Travis Kelsill, CEO of CrewGear.com uh, Industrial Dream Supply. So, we are back uh, as I get a little bit comfy. This is segment two where I'm going to take you through the build process of the DESA, the Definitive Edition Screen Accurate Razor Glove as far as crew gear is concerned. And what I wanted to uh, show you guys is when last we saw the DESA Part 1 slash Part 2 slash Becker clone, we'll just call it the Becker clone, um, I had uh, indicated that I had done a basic, uh, you know, very faux Becker finish, very light Becker finish, uh, but it's amazing how much a little bit of weathering and a little bit of detailing can change the entire look uh, of a razor glove. And that goes toward the perspective of the builder builder being me. So, I'm going to show you something that I went ahead and did. I'm going to show you the very same glove you just saw, and uh, I'll do some kind of a cross-dissolve situation, I'm sure, uh, in a little while. But I have brought the Becker clone kind of a little bit more up to the uh, documentary, the NSA documentary uh, Becker Scenes. Mike, I know I keep mentioning you. Uh, thanks, man. Um, really just... Thank you. Uh, you know, the whole Becker sequence, let's call it. Um, I, you know, I was looking at the glove and I was like, you know what, I want this, I went, I went that far, let's go the whole nine yards. So, it's by no means, you know, this is my first attempt at doing uh, the glove as it appears today. Um, and it, I got pretty close, actually. I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, impressed. I'm going to show it to you. Um, you know, you saw a little bit of the, uh, you know, I dyed up a glove really quick. It doesn't have to be perfect. I think the Becker glove is just a little bit lighter, but I did that basic brown glove to lay the armature on because I'm not putting the braces on. But when last you saw it, uh, it was lightly weathered, had some of the Becker detail. And uh, what we've done is added even more of that detail. And I, the lighting in here, the camera quality, you got to forgive it, it really is terrible. Um, but you can probably make out, it is a little bit darker, it's a bit more weathered. Uh, the back plate, everything else is pretty severe. And I think what we're going to do is, I've got better lighting coming from this angle, I'm going to go ahead and cut to some close-ups of this. and. Uh, we'll take a look at what's been done, but I wanted to talk about something really quick. You know, I, I, I talked and I talked in the last portion of this video about how um, I was finally happy with the piece, and I am. Uh, but, you know, it just goes to show you have to go that final nine yards, because what I discovered, once I added all this really, really heavy, heavy weathering to this glove, is the volumes will change in, in how they look. And, you know, again, it's light, it's reflection, it's all those things. Uh, what I ended up doing was, I was about two millimeters too thick on this underside of the middle uh, knuckle, and I was about two and a half, almost three millimeters too thick in terms of its base volume uh, on the uh, on the ring knuckle. So I went ahead and I filed that down, and I also filed down this section here. So when you compare whatever turnarounds I end up doing, uh, you can take a look at the difference. That's the only thing that I changed, and I added the weather. So you know, it's it's just one of it's part and parcel to the process. It's it's one of those things that you uh, you you realize once you put the final touches and the final details on, and really see how it pairs up to uh, compares to. Um, your your base reference material. So uh, now <laughs> it's done. A uh, little bit of filing took me about an hour, and uh, now I'm uh, extremely happy with it. Um, and uh, you know, looking at those little pieces, don't bug me. So there you go. And uh, I wanted to show you something else also. If you'll excuse me. Excuse me. It's over here. I'm going to show you the uh, new DESA leather, and this is a part two leather uh, that's not totally done. I haven't uh, bleached out the braid. By the way, if you get the gloves from Carolina Glove uh, Supply, 
uh, you get these black braids and the black uh, ball and tape uh, strap. What you want to do is bleach that. It'll bleach out in like three or four minutes and then dye it. So this is black. I haven't done that yet. But I wanted to show you some of the detail on this. Before, and uh, I may put this on in close-up at some point, but again, because I'm not attaching the braces, uh, it's not on priority. I have altered a couple things. Uh, if you look at this section here, what I call the diamond back, because it's a diamond and it kind of goes back, uh, that wasn't totally accurate on my last gloves. It kind of is now. But what I'm really, really proud of is the new detail that I added, the cuff wrinkles, all this wrinkle detail. Uh, so when you pull it up, it, it does that nice, uh, that nice, you know, snug thing. And, um, you know, I, you know I, I mean, I gave it a little bit here and there, and I, and I cross-stitched it. I'll do some close-ups on that. But now we've got that nice wrinkle effect happening. So everything else is pretty much the same. Um, you know, it's got the base weathering, a little bit uh, more pumpkin, a little uh, more brown. The lighting here, the color is not accurate uh, for screen, but you get the basic idea. So... That's the changes to this glove that I've done. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. If you want to see how this will actually lay and look, this will be the last part that we do here. I'll do it the best I can without braces. Uh, the scale is down considerably. I'll be doing a, a scale comparison with the templates. Uh, so bear with me on that. It is a little bit smaller. I'm sure it would fit Robert's hand pretty nicely. But there you go. This is how it actually looks on the hand. Oh, one other detail. You might notice the pinky blade on the part two, which is the last we saw of the glove on screen, you know, it, it's been bent over that way. As far as how the glove looks, from what I can tell, in the Becker sequence on the NSA documentary, somebody's bent it back. So this is how I want it to look as it looks today. I didn't bend the pinky. When you see the finished copy of the Part 2 glove uh, later uh, in another segment of this uh, documentary, I will bend the blade and you will go ahead and uh, see that detail. Uh, but right now, we're just kind of looking at how everything is working. Let's try to get a classic pose here. It's really difficult without the braces, but we're going to do our best. So there you go. There you go, guys. That's how Becker, in my opinion, would look on someone's hand. And you can make out the scale and how everything's kind of laying and uh, all that good stuff. This is almost more fun for me than it is for you guys. Okay, so there you go. Nice and weathered. And uh, We'll do some close-ups later on. But for the time being, guys, this is Travis Cowsill saying thank you for watching, and uh, let's continue on with creating the DESA. Here is, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, my little homage to Escape from New York. Uh, John Carpenter is a big influence on my life, as are many directors. Uh, Wes Craven as well. These are the tools, guys. This is what I use, and I'm going to be getting into pretty much everything that you're looking at. There are a couple things that I'm not going to tell you about, but on the whole, uh, you're going to get about 99.9% .9 of it. I'm going to keep like one or two things close to the chest, but they're inconsequential. If you want to build gloves, you're going to get enough, trust me. So out of everything that you're looking at here... Uh, let's say I will not, I probably won't talk about three things, but let's talk about what we're going to be using. First thing you're going to need are three sets of pliers, uh, small, medium, and large. The next thing you're going to need are gloves, and uh, the, you're looking at a glove from the Carolina Glove Company. It's the closest to the part one I've ever seen. The original part one and part two, uh, before Wells and Mont shifted the, the seam uh, construction on them from the original 1178s, uh, you're going to need a weathered glove as your reference. That's a naturally weathered glove. Then you're going to need an experiment glove to test out your weathering procedures. Uh, it's always good to have something on hand that you can just you know wreck if you need to. 
Again, this is just how I do it, guys. I mean, there's, there's, you know, you can do it your way, but this is how I do it, so this is what I'm explaining to you. Then you're going to need your master copy cut pattern glove, so you don't have to, you know, it's, it's always good to see it on the physical piece. It's good, you know, you can draw it on a piece of paper, but I always like to have the physical piece in front of me. Then you need your master copy cut glove to compare things to, and this is my new DSA uh, part two that you're looking at. Two sets of C-clamps, small. Really important that you have two. <clears throat> uh, you need paste flux. Doesn't really matter if it's Rosencore solder or any of that. Just a couple of really good cans of, uh, just a couple of cans of uh, paste. It's important that it's paste though. And a good supply of band-aids. You trust me, you will need them. Everything else up here we'll talk about a little bit later. That's later in the process, but uh, I'll show you a couple things from that area of the bin in a second. This, I cannot stress enough. This is what I call the magic tool. I don't even think I know what this is really called. Uh, you are looking at one of the two surviving tools that I originally started using as a kid building these gloves. This tool is 23 years old. And, you know, if you're looking at it, uh, if you've seen the Shawshank Redemption, then you know where I'm going with this. This is, <laughs> this is the, you know, the rock hammer after, after 23 years of tunneling through the wall. Uh, it's really, and, and, and frankly, the more you use it, the better it gets. Uh, you can see it is worn down to the nub, but uh, you know, it softens it, and uh, because you're working with a very malleable metal with copper, uh, especially the copper, but the brass too, really, um, the you know the softer and, and and more you know kind of sanded down it gets, the better it is for the metal. So uh, that's why I've held on to it as long as I have, and taken as good of care of it as I have. Uh, this is the other tool. This is the magic ruler. Yes, I call it the magic ruler, and that's the magic tool. This has also been with me for 23 years. Yeah, I, both of these tools have worked on every single glove I've ever worked on. And how did they survive when I lost, you know, all my shit in Hurricane Katrina? I always have these on me. They're my good luck charms. They're always in my pockets. Uh, this, and you know, here's my work area. And the stuff that you're seeing on the floor, like, you know, the back plates over there, those, I mean, and the extra bits of metal, all this stuff, I keep on hand for a variety of reasons. None of it's final. Um, even, you know, the knuckles that you see there, I, I keep them because either there are errors on them that I want to remind myself of, or there are, you know, small sections of very accurate portions that I didn't want to have to rebuild the entire piece to get, so I kept. So, you know, you look at those back plates and, and, and you know, it, one corner might be a corner that I use on the final back plate. One might be, you know, and, and, and until I built the Becker clone, which I'll use primarily for the part two, but also for the part one. Um, but I have another part one backplate that I'll use as my reference. But until I built this glove, I, I this is how I did it. You can see all these little pieces over here. And so the knuckle piece has, you know, the, the flat area that's accurate on that one. Or the ring, I like the corner on that one. Or, you know, the pinky has the basic shape for this or that. So I keep all this stuff in, <clears throat> in bags, labeled bags. And when I get into the gloves, you know, I know which piece to pull and all that. But now I have this final copy of the Becker glove, which is going to serve as my main copy. But I still keep all this stuff on hand just in case. And you can see there's my master blades up there. Uh, giving it a quick reshape on the bottom. You know, you, you pull these things around and you, you nick them and, and, and sometimes you sit on them, whatever you do. The, you know, you got to make sure they're really, really straight. So I was just adjusting a little corner that had tweaked up and I wanted it flat because I knew I was going to be tracing it. And so this is how we start uh, with a Sharpie Magic Marker, very, very carefully. Uh, and you've got to make sure the tip is, you know, blunted a little bit. You've got to get into all the nooks and crannies. And this is very, very time consuming because it is all done by hand. And I, I think some of the glove guys may, may punch their templates out with laser cutters and things like that. That's really, really cool. Um, if I had that option, I probably would take advantage of it just for time. But there's also something I really enjoy about doing this by hand, knowing full well that that's how it was done um, for the film, uh, as far as my information is concerned. So you can see me here 
I mean, even after I trace it, I have to get in there and really check and, and see and make sure that I got it as close as I, as I could to the original. And there's a little trick I do at the end. You have to wait for the, the Sharpie to dry, otherwise it will smear. And you really have to keep the pressure down while you're tracing because it'll shift. And if it shifts, you've ruined your whole piece. You can't replace, you know, and uh, replace it. And there, there you saw my trick. Once I know it's dry, I pop it off really, really quick. That avoids the smears if there's any, you know, moisture left in the ink. And uh, give it a quick once-over and make sure it's all as close as it possibly can. And, and I do the same thing when I cut it. You know, and when you hand cut this stuff, look, you know, you get it as close as you can. When you trace it, you get it as close as you can. Each single piece is going to have its own little difference, nuance. You know, a, a millimeter, a half a millimeter might be off here and there. I'm having a really strong deja vu right now. Uh, and you do what you can. You know, you're, you can only be so perfect. So as long as I get it really, really close, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. But uh, you'll actually see me at some point make a mistake and I'll, I'll put an... Anytime you see me put an X on something, that means error. And that means no use -y. So, uh, you know, as I trace this stuff off, you know, I'm not going to do every single knuckle, you know, shooting every single knuckle as I trace it here. This is, this is just to get us going. And, um, you know, I'm, you know, I have client orders that I'm, I'm still filling a few, I'm a few left, um, not many, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm, by, I'm by no means done. So, uh, you know, part of this video process while I'm going to be, you know, uh, this, this whole excursion is not for me just to build a part one and a part two from the mother glove. Uh, from the DESA clone of the Becker glove, it, it's also this is for work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm stuff that I'm not including on this video is the you know the three or four other gloves I'm, I'm making at the same time. So I'm just including you know I'm shooting as much footage as I can of, of two of them that I'm doing for a couple of clients, and uh, you know eventually I'll cut all this together and and, and put it up there for posterity. So uh, as I bump the camera, you can. Uh, Watch the magic happen. Uh, yeah, I work on the floor. And yeah, it's uncomfortable. But there's just so much going on. And I, I, I like having the, the ability to move around and really... It's a bit like that Friends episode, if you ever saw the one where they go to London and, and Joey, you know, God love him, is... Uh, and yeah, I was a huge Friends fan. Great, great writing. Uh, Joey and Chandler are standing there and they're lost and... Joey looks at Chandler and says, you know what I got to do? Got to go into the map. <laughs> you know what I mean? So this is me going into the work. And uh, I like kind of, you know, having the option of moving around if I need to and just everything at a glance and all over the place but sort of organized, you know, controlled chaos. Um, and I need the pressure, frankly. I need to be able to, to, be able to really put that pressure on. And if I'm, if I'm sitting down, I, I, I can't do that. And things will wobble. And I like this, the sturdiness and the steadiness of the work floor. I'm not going to give you everything, but I'm going to give you the important points. I'm going to give you how to get all these bends on, on the index knuckle. I'm going to give you how to get the shape on the middle knuckle, which is a, a really difficult um, piece for many glove makers. I mean, I am one of them. Uh, and from what I've you know read, seen, heard, it just seems to be a topic of discussion. I'm going to show you how to get what I call the uh, cauliflower uh, segment. Uh, over here on the, uh, the ring knuckle. I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to show you how to get basically all the shapes. What I'm not going to kind of go into is, you know, the finer details. You'll see them. I'm, I might not talk about them. I might mention them. There are little tweaks and pulls and, and little bends and asymmetries that are done to each little part of, you know, several of these pieces. Uh, specifically when we get to the tips. There's, the tips are a monster. Uh, there's so much detail in terms of the metal work. But we'll talk about that later. Let's start with the uh, index knuckle. And once we get all the knuckles done, I'll concentrate on the tips. And uh, then we will discuss uh, the blades in depth. Uh, we'll discuss the rivets. Uh, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this back plate. Because the back plate is... Uh, I could do a whole documentary on the back plate itself. So, uh, thank you for your patience, and thank you for your interest, and uh, let's proceed now with segment six uh, of the construction of the DESA part one and part two from the Mother Glove, the Becker clone. Again, always sit very humbly. Again, thank you, Mike, for all the reference that you've shown thus far, 
and uh, we'll see you in just a little bit. And hopefully, in the end, we'll all have learned something about this monstrosity that has taken over so many aspects of all our lives for the last, I guess, almost 30 years now, uh, since the original film. Uh, this is Travis, as always, your humble servant and, uh, and uh, host, saying, whatever you do, yada, 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 yada. See you in a bit. So here we go. Getting into the uh, first stages of construction. And uh, here's the workstation, the DESA Becker clone disassembled once again, and look, yep, Grab whatever you can, guys, because apparently uh, I am showing a few things. But for those of you who think that's my DESA master backplate, it's not. That was my original first attempt. It's far too big, far too inaccurate. Um, but those are some of my final pieces. Um, I decided to show you guys a little bit. I'm not going to give you full-on dead-on shots. There will be a little forced perspective. But for those of you that can figure out what you can figure out from them, please, and if you take my knowledge and my expertise on this at any face value and you think it's worth it, grab and uh, see if you can figure out what I was doing there. So here I am setting up and uh, today's musical selection, because we don't have video to go along with the audio, is uh, Christopher Nolan's Inception. If you haven't seen it, I highly suggest you do. It is one of my uh, favorite work movies uh, of the year. And uh, it's just kind of where my mood is, I guess. Sometimes I'll do, you know, Back to the Future, or the trilogy, or, you know, Indiana Jones, or Star Wars, or, you know, Hannibal. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, sometimes uh, the, uh, sometimes the uh, nightmare films, definitely. Um, building a glove is a very solitary process, and uh, you really get into the zone. Uh, as an artist, uh, any artist will tell you when you commit to your art, whatever the project is, it uh, time seems to do very strange things. You'll look at your watch and three or four hours will have passed. And it's very much like this. And uh, for those of you who are wondering, no, I'm not naked. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my knee is blown out. I, you know, I'm in my work clothes. My work clothes are ratty, blown out jeans and, uh, you know, the t-shirt of the hour whatever that happens to be. So we're going to start uh, the build process. And a lot of this is going to be self-explanatory. And this first uh, section, you can see here me grabbing my large pipe that we talked about in segment three and taking my first index template piece, my final piece, and uh, starting to apply the pressure. And what you're going to notice as I do all this is that it's all about, for me, incremental increases, decreases of pressure and strength torquing of the metal, uh, and stages. And what I'm doing right now is getting the basic curvature. And you know, these things aren't totally curved. None of the finger pieces are. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> the undersides, the, uh, if you're looking at the curved piece right there in front of you, the section facing us that runs along the rivet uh, side. Once this piece is fully bent, it actually kind of tucks under very slightly around the sides and you're going to be seeing me demonstrating uh, not just the curvature but I'm going to point out the reflectivity of certain uh, bent sections of the metal and that being one of them you know I when I'm bending this again I'm trying to get a certain reflection on a certain angle at a certain point and not just curving it now I've, I've grabbed uh, this is just a very one of my ragtag old inaccurate test pieces um, it's nothing you know, in terms of size, it was probably a, an early ring or an early middle or whatever. Uh, but I keep it because it's my it's my reference point of of you know a rough approximation of the width and breadth of the curvature of the piece. And uh, what I'm doing right here is taping off my hammer. This is very important if you want to do things uh, the Krugier way. Uh, is to soften all your hard blunt force objects. Always good to soften those hard blunt force objects, or so I've heard. I won't say who from. 
yeah, this is what I'm going to be doing a lot of the uh, the initial shaping with, and um, it may look like I'm actually striking this really hard, but I'm not. And you'll see it's more rapid succession of, of mini strikes than it is actual hammering out of the metal. I do things very delicately, um, for the most part. Even when I'm applying the uh, the bend methods, which you're going to see me using the magic tool on, very little force is used. Very subtle movements. I really because I don't want to fuck the metal up, frankly. Uh, and and you'll see me doing that. Uh, so, but again, this I was I'm digressing. This first section is going to be really long and tedious. I'm just showing you because I'm not going to show you this for every finger. I'm going to show you what I what I'm doing here is what I do for every single finger, as far as the knuckles are concerned. The, uh, the tips have a completely different um, approach, while using some of the same tools and methods a little bit, but really, it's a very very different approach. So this is what I do for the knuckles, and it's a constant adjustment and refinement. I'm trying to just get the curvature of this pipe because this is the base curvature and then we're going to build upon that and get more curves. And what I'm doing right now is I'm always, ch you know, I'm, I'm anal, I'm, I'm checking my metal and I'm tapping it here because I want it to lay completely flat at this point. I want it, even though it's, it's asymmetrical, I want the basic symmetry to lay completely flat before I start tweaking the shapes. Um, that ha that's how I know I get an even curve as if I'm creating, which is the point here, the kind of you know movie uh, prefabbed uh, knuckles that uh, the Sandman of our dreams spills out of the paper bag. That's kind of what I'm going for here. So I'm trying to create the machine, perfect machine look of these before I then go and mangle them. Why I don't know. Seems to work for me. Uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> and you're going to see me comparing these two fingers a lot. And you're going to see me switching them from right to left. And now I've grabbed my second stage pipe. And this is going to give us even more of the curvature. Um, and, you know, I used to, when I first started building these, I used to just put them on the mallet and hammer them out. But you get all these dents and malformed, you know, sections. And, and, and what I'm trying to do is remain consistent between all of the gloves, even if it's just one version. I want it consistent. I want it to match as close as humanly possible. Um, between each copy, and there's always going to be differences. You know, you you, you pick your battles, uh, but this is all about consistency, and the only way for me to get consistency is to compare. And the reason that you'll see me switching them from left to right, like I'll be holding two of them, and you'll see, and all of a sudden I'll switch them, their positions, and that's because my left eye and my right eye, I have you know, um, you know, uh, like a stigmatism thing, like uh, you know, one eye sees a little like a hair closer than the left. So I always have to reverse them because my right eye sees things a little fatter than my left eye. It's very strange. And whenever I do that, that's why I'm doing it. I'm playing a trick on my eye. And it's a bit of an animator's trick also, uh, where an animator or an artist will do a drawing. And then if you want to see your mistakes, flip your drawing over against the light or a window or a light box. And all of a sudden, the perspective shift will show you your errors that you can't see from the original view. And, you know, so on and so on and so on. So here we are. And, uh, you know, again, this is stuff I learned over years and years and years. And this may not be, you know, to your liking. You may not like how this goes. But I'm going to show this to you now because I'm not going to show you this part of the process after this. After we get through this and I show you the setup for each finger that you can expect to do on all of them, uh, we're just going to go into the actual shaping of the remaining knuckles. So just bear with us on this. But, you know, this is... Uh, this is the process. And you, again, you know, here I am applying more force, more force, more force. I always try to approach this organically with as much muscle as I can and as little use of tools as is possible. I want the metal to be as pristine as it can, possibly can be because then I'm going to go in and really mess it up purposefully. Um, you know, and you know, I don't want to make an error. There are going to be errors. There are going to be Again, you know, little differences between each copy. I wish there weren't. Um, but they're so minuscule that I've kind of learned to let that go. So all these details and, and little hints and instructional vagaries uh, in the end do turn out to be really important. And yeah, you guys, if you take a look over to my left, those are uh, two official um, post Becker clone DESA middle knuckles, if you want to take a look and see if you can figure out what's going on. 
<clears throat> guess I'm showing a few things I didn't plan on showing. Anyway, so now I'm checking the reflections and we're going to start um, doing the tuck under to get these long axis um, fold overs, we'll call them, that I talked about earlier. And it's a very gentle process as most things are. You can see me using my plier here and uh, very, very gently I'm applying very subtle pressure because if you do too much you'll get dents and as I work my way up the uh, up the axis of these pieces the pressure gets lighter and lighter and lighter because once I've gotten the bottom of these shaped uh, I then focus on the top and kind of meet the uh, reflections uh, at the stopping point so you'll see me kind of moving up and then stopping just uh, above the halfway point uh, of this piece with these uh, with these tuck unders and this is just to get those those softened bends you can see them starting to really form getting that nice line of reflection down the uh, long axis tapering into the side point along either side of the bottom rivet hole and <clears throat> in just a minute will be addressing the uh, crease, the uh, index uh, crease point across the uh, across the. So you have to just bear with me on that. So I'm going to show you how I do this crease. I don't know how the other guys do their creases. Some guys don't do the crease at all, um, and that's you know that's how they see the glove. Um, but it is you know as far as I'm concerned, it is there. And uh, this is, uh, you know, this specific, you know, we were talking just a second ago about what was kind of taught to me um, with regard to the gloves and the authentic methods. This was never taught to me. This is something I had to figure out on my own, and it just seems to work. So this is Travis's uh, approach to getting the crease. What I'm doing here is I'm taking one of you. You've seen these on the floor. I've got two long uh, skirts of um, solid steel. Um, about, uh, you know, I don't know, a third of an inch in, in thickness. And I picked these up at a junkyard years ago, um, maybe four or five years ago, when I was, you know, slowly rebuilding my, my glove uh, construction supplies to get crew gear back up and running and fill out my final orders. And I was lucky enough to find these. And uh, what I'm doing right now is, uh, because I, again, it's all about keeping the metal as pristine as you can while still applying the details you need. Uh, I'm taking a piece of my used sandpaper that I'm not going to use anymore. I've turned it over so I've got the back end 